it goes back down to go who you are. Who do you, knowing who you are, not what you want. I want the bigger house, I want the better life, I want more time, work-life balance. That's all the things you want. But who, what about you? What do you want and why do you want it? Because once you start following that path, you know, well, I'm here and this is what I want and why I want it then it doesn't matter about the path because you're focused on the path. You're not focused on anybody else. It is your race to run. It is not, remember, you're the one on the track. You're the one that's been practicing every day to run the 100 meters. There is a reason why football players, soccer players get paid an awful lot of money. They get paid more, but then people will pay for tickets in the stadium because they're not willing to put the work in. They're not willing to be the success. They'd rather sit there and moan at you for succeeding and shout at you for the silly mistakes that you made that they disagree with. Hello and welcome to The Real Success Show. I'm your host, Candice Mama. Before we jump into this week's episode, I want to let you guys know that this will be my last episode on The Real Success Show. It has been my greatest privilege and pleasure to walk alongside you with our incredible guests. I'm going to miss you all so much and you have all impacted my journey in tremendous, tremendous ways. I will continue to love and support The Real Success Network, but I wanted to just let you know how much I love each and every one of you. Now, if you have ever wanted to convert clients into raving fans and into high ticket clientele, then Gary Lafferty is the man you want to listen to. Before I, we go into Larry, you know what I'm gonna ask you to do? Be sure to like, share and subscribe so that more people will find us. Now, here's Gary. Real success show. I, I, I'm happy to be here. It's great. Yeah, Gary, I want to know the question I start all my guests off with is how do you define yourself? Um, I define myself as a presentation and sales mentor. And I just love working with entrepreneurs, coaches, and, and consultants to help them build and scale the business that they really deserve. You know, and I feel a lot of people are running businesses or want to run businesses, but they're just not reaching the scale they deserve, but, but using two main things. And that is their passion and the power of their voice, both of which most entrepreneurs have an abundance of. And by using the, you know, their passion and the power of their voice to build more sales and convert more clients. I just love being able to do that and help people do that. I love that, Gary. And I mean, no one grows up saying like, I want to help people, you know, scale their businesses. So I want to know what led you to this point? Um, well, it started off when I first started. That's a really good question because I used to run a, a real estate business when I lived in the UK in London. And in the late 90s, um, I was listening to personal development tapes. You know, the, the tapes used to stick in the car and it used to, it used to get wound up and then only yeah, we were saying today, if you get a pencil out, you've got to twist it around so it all fits again, and then you put it back in. So a 20-minute tape would take you 45 minutes to hear because it kept getting jammed in the car. But one of the guys I used to listen to, one of the mentors that I used to listen to was, was Zig Ziglar. And one phrase that he said to me over and over and over again, which stuck with me, was, you can have anything you want in life as long as you help other people get what they want in life. and being in a real estate market at that time, it was always, oh, I'm helping people get their ideal home. I'm helping people move. I'm helping people get that. And then from there, I started teaching my staff that. And from teaching my staff that and building my company and then going out and someone asked me once, would you come and speak to a group of entrepreneurs on building their business and improving their sales? And I thought, wow, yeah, I can do that. But just to see a room, I think there was about 50 people in the room at the time. And just to see almost like, a weight lifted off their shoulders and thought, I can do this. Sales isn't that hard as long as we look at it from the right direction and just see them think, wow, I can do this. This inspiration, that was the beginning. And that was thought, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to help people grow their business so they don't have to live under this bushel, as it were, you know, of thinking, ooh, I hate sales. 
I love it. And even when you describe it, you come across with so much passion for what you do, which I absolutely adore. And, you know, you uh, refer to Zig Ziglar as one of your mentors. And I mm. love that. I know a lot of people think that the only way I'm going to make it is if Gary himself is walking me step by step on the process. If, you know, Zig Ziglar himself is there holding my hand. But how did you form these relationships with different mentors, ones you knew and ones you didn't? Um, the relationship with mentors starts, I think it always starts with one. You're absolutely right. It starts with one and they inspire you. And when they inspire you to take action, I think there's a lot of noise out there in the marketplace. You know, we've been bombarded every single day by this mentor, that guru, this new thing, this almost like this brightly shiny scribble syndrome that, you know, we've got to be jumping around everywhere. When ultimately, if you do find someone that you connect with, then you almost hang on their every word. And Zig Ziglar was definitely one of those for me. Jay Abraham was another one of those for me. And then there became others and others from there. But it almost like, yes, just sometimes, it's almost like, um, I call it the Ikea syndrome, is that once you found that mentor, just follow the instructions at least once. You know, just follow those instructions, follow what they say, step by step, then you can improvise, then you can bring yourself into it. But just follow it step by step, because they've been there, they've done that, they've done the trenches, they've come out of it, they've got the battle scars. So they're almost doing you a favor that you don't have to do that, you don't have to step on those landmines. Once you've learned how to go from A to B once, then it's just a case of repeating, rinsing, repeating and growing from there. Oh man, you refer to it as the IKEA syndrome, which I think is brilliant. Um, <laughs> and when you were speaking about, you know, committing to one mentor and following through on all the steps. And I find that a lot of people, you know, including myself, I'm no different. Uh, you'll listen to a mentor and then you'll be like, you know, Gary, I, I like step one. I like step five. I like step 10. Uh, the rest of the steps just, just don't work for me. <laughs> Do you encounter that as you become a teacher, as you become a teacher and as you teach your students? Um, yes, all the time. And I think it's becoming more and more prevalent as the years go on. And I've been doing this for many, many years now, but the world has changed. We've changed as people. And with the uh, growth of the internet, the growth of uh, online information, there is too much information. And when you couple that with the need, the human need for instant gratification, where people just want to jump, you know, we can, we can order a pizza on a button. We can order a taxi or an Uber on a button. We can change channels. We can order a holiday. We can have anything we want super quickly, which unfortunately then breeds this habit, if you like, of shortcutting. And it's, it's almost like if you think about it from a military perspective, you imagine a, a young soldier coming up and they said, this is what you got to do. And he goes, well, I don't really fancy doing that bit. You know, or when, when, when something happens, you want to duck. Ah, ducking doesn't really work for me. You know, I just want to just run straight towards them or I want to, it doesn't work. You have to follow a set of principles because those principles keep you safe. And it becomes muscle memory. And again, we, we see all this uh, social media about instant change, instant fortunes, instant bodybuilding, instant glamification. They say, I don't have to go to the gym. All I need to do is take this pill, go to the gym, take a couple of photos, and I'm going to be, bing, I'm going to be perfect. You know, and it does, the world doesn't work that way. You've got to go through that pain. And that's what the bit that people don't want to do. They go, I like set one, like you say. And I get it. I, I mean, I do the same as well. You know, I thought, ooh, I like step one. Step one's really interesting. By the time I get to step three, can we just can we just go to step five? I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to do the hard bit. But like everything else, I think again, I wish I knew that the, the mentor taught me this. In fact, I do remember it. Peter, Peter Thompson from the UK, and he says, look, if you want an easy life, do the hard things. Do the hard things. But if you want a hard life, then just do the easy things. So you, if, you, if our aim as business owners, as human beings, is have the best life that we can possibly have, then unfortunately, we have to take some pain with it. We, if we want to have the best physique, we have to put our body through that pain. Whereas once we've gone through that pain, it's, ha, it becomes muscle memory. 
and building a business and being in sales and and giving building the business that you want and so that you can have a life that you want sometimes you have to go through that pain but once you get through the other side then you can have the life that you desire and be happy with it oh that is brilliant and you know, you mentioned something, Gary, about, you know, the process from A to B, right? Once you figure that out, you rinse and repeat. However, no matter how often you do something, there are going to be new challenges, there's going to be new fears, there's going to be more failures. And I want to know, how do you deal with those failures when they come around? Yeah, you know, that's a, a really interesting point. And so I'm going to backpedal a little bit to that because I think it's very important. We will always get challenges, as you say. There's always going to be nuances. There's always going to be something different. The world will always throw something odd at us that we weren't prepared for. And therefore, it goes back to that military example that I gave you with, is that once you know the core basics, once you've practiced the core basics, then you're only actually trying to deal with the nuance. You're only, you're only having to deal with the change, as opposed to having to relearn everything all over again. And I think one of the biggest challenges I see with my clients when they first come is that they haven't laid that proper foundation. So they're, they're constantly dealing with challenges as new challenges that they're adding to the, the challenge bucket. Yeah, and they just keep adding this bucket. And that this, this is when we have a, a, a life of overwhelm. This is when we have entrepreneur burnout because they're not for, they haven't got the basic muscle memory, the practice, the foundations that actually keeps them safe, actually keeps them going through the hard times. So that if something comes, if a, a, a new challenge comes, they can either deal with it as in its little entirety, or it just bounces off them because you go, do you know what? That actually doesn't bother me. That is not going to affect me. Why? Because I have this process that works. So I don't get distracted, as it were. But when it does happen, I think it's a case of, going back to your question of how do I deal with it? It's a case of isolating it. Don't add it to the big bucket. We, we've all got a busy day. We've all got to do what we've got to do. If you add it to the bucket, so it just increases in strength. It increases in power. It increases this uh, overwhelmness of you. So let's look at it in, its, in itself. Is it a big thing? Can I? And I love the fact that I can look at something and go, is it really that important? Can I just get rid of it? Can I ignore it? Or can I delegate it? All right. Or do is, is this a new skill set that I've got to learn? You know, and, and when COVID hit, uh, the presentation skill set had to change. So we had to learn that. We couldn't just bounce that off. But the foundation was there. So it's just a little pivot that we had to make as opposed to a complete change. Oh, that is such a good distinction. And I'm so curious to know, Gary, pre-Zig Ziglar, Gary Lafferty, as opposed to after Zig Ziglar, you know, I want to know when you are walking your path and your journey, what are the biggest differences that you see in yourself between before you started in this world as opposed to after? The value of time. Mm. I think when I pre-personal development, pre-business development, pre-learning from other people. I thought my world was pretty cocooned. I thought, this is me. This is, my, this is my world. This is my job. This is my career. It's almost like the old adage that we've always been taught. I'm half Chinese, by the way. So I was brought up by a single Chinese mother. So it, as all Asians know, it's you go to school, you work hard, you work hard, you go to university, you work harder. Once you go to university, you get a job, you work even harder. You know, you just keep work, 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 work. And it became that mantra that unless you were working hard, you were a failure. Unless you were working tremendously, tremendously better than anybody else, you would never succeed. And I was caught in that rut of just work, 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 work. You know, I was busy for, busy for being busy sake. But unfortunately, I was just trying to run around and catch my own tail. You can never catch your own tail. But once I realized that actually that, 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 that phrase, you know, work smart, not hard, not hard. Well, actually, I disagree with that for a little bit because you've got to work hard first to understand what smart is. You can't just go, I'm working smarter than anybody else, but I'm not going to work hard. You know, it's, it's just going to land with me. And, and in reality, come back and bites you. So yes, it is a case of working hard, but what changed was the fact that actually, if you still work hard, but use a smarter mentality and say, actually, what is the value of my hour? What is the value of my day? What impact do I want to give on the world out there? So 
how my presentation career came about was the, the realization that how many people, more people could I help in one 90 minute, one 60 minute, one one day workshop, as opposed to dealing with one person. Therefore, my time was saved, their time was saved, and together we had more time in the world. Because no matter who you are, where you live, male, female, whatever gender, we still only have 24 hours, right? We've only got 24 hours. And um, the rich don't get any more, the poor don't get any less. So it's learning about how can we utilize that the very best way we can to get the best of what we can get out of life. Oh, that is such a powerful statement, the value of time. And speaking of time, we don't have that much of it. And I know a lot of people, especially in our community, will reach out and say, I've got this massive goal to accomplish, but I've also got my family. I've also got all these other responsibilities and I'm struggling to keep this balance. So how yes. do you maintain a good balance between your different parts of your life? That's really good balance. I think the key, that one thing I've really enjoyed seeing my clients and myself now do is finding this balance in life. Um, so there's, there's two main things I really want to share with people here is number one, it won't come overnight. It won't come up. The balance won't come up. If you're already at this level, even just thinking about it from a visual perspective, if you're already here, it's going to take a long time to go over there. And quite frankly, if you went too quickly, you're just going to be flinged off into another realm and another realm of busyness. All right. So you really want this kind of a smooth uh, transition, if you like. But the second part of it would be focus on what you really want. There's a, there's, what I have found is people don't really truly know what their why is. Why are they actually doing it? What is it they really want to achieve for themselves? I think it's almost inbred in us now not to think about ourselves and to think about, oh, I want to serve, I want to do this, I want to help whoever people, which is great. But what about you? You can't help anybody else if you are suffering. You've got to come out of those trenches first. You've got to put that armor on. You've got to be that gladiator that you can go out and protect people and help people. So you've got to look inwards first, like charity. But if you want to pay money, give money to charity, you've got to make the money first. You can't give money for nothing, right? You've got to find it. You've got to look after your family first, then others. So it's a case of knowing what you really want and then be realistic about time frames. Yes, there's a, uh, we talked about this earlier, about the shiny syndrome, uh, about the, the instant gratification. Um, there is, you want a pizza? You can have instant gratification. You want a perfect life? Then you've got to go through a process of maybe relearning. Think about it this way. The bus that got you to where you are today isn't the right vehicle to get you to where you want to be. If you remain on that bus and seeing everything fly by, this is, this is the challenge we're going to have. So you've got to realize that I do have to step off this bus. But I appreciate there's mortgages, there's rent, there's school kids, there's pinnacle, because I've got to pay all that. My, my, my commitments are still there. But be realistic in what you really want. Who are you? Why do you actually want it? And that strong enough why will you'll find that balance somehow. You'll find that balance because you're thinking, yes, this is what I've got to put up with. This is where I really want to be. Because I've got this clear goal, then you're moving in one direction. When you don't have a clear goal, you're kind of like getting into an Uber or getting into a cab and the driver say, where do you want to go? And I go, I don't know, just anywhere but here. I just don't want to be here. Just anywhere would do. You imagine it'll cost you more in, in cab fares, it'll cost you more in fuel, it'll cost you more in time. So be very laser focused. Find out what you truly do want and why, then the process becomes a lot easier and faster. I love that. And especially the focus on what do you want? I think it's a question that people may not even ask themselves as they're listening to this because they're like, I know what I want. I want a family. I want a car. I want a house. But people don't get very laser focused on what exactly that looks like for them. And exactly. speaking of which, Gary, I've realized that a lot of people, especially in the past two years and this craziness we've been living in, we've gone digital, right? And a lot of people have gone into what we call now the great resignation because yes. they've experienced burnout. They've experienced all these symptoms and i want to know from you for people who are listening right now and they've reached that point of burnout what can they do and have you ever been there yourself level of burnout absolutely i've been there i was on medication um i went through a big bout of depression for many years um i was on medication for depression and for, for many other things and it's one of those once you get into that thing you, you 
you you can't see the wood from the trees. You think that I just have to deal with this and maybe medication will help and maybe be seeing the right people. And I went through lots of therapy as a person and everybody, in fact, it was, I was in South Africa because I spent a, a five years in South Africa and I went to saw a, a, a clinical psychologist and I saw many, but this guy who's absolutely fantastic. And he taught me one thing. And he said to me, he goes, Gary, you've got to stop being the Gucci suit with dirty underwear. And, and what that's meant to me was that on the surface, everybody saw that I was mentoring people around the world, I was on stages around the world, and, and, and I just looked the part, but inside I was a complete mess. And I couldn't serve people the way I wanted to serve people if internally I was broken, if internally I was burnt out, if internally I didn't know where I wanted to go. And having that time to say, okay, it's not about the facade anymore. What it is, is about truly knowing who you are, truly knowing what you want and why do you actually want it. I want to spend more time with my children. I want to spend more time with my family. I'm going to stop traveling. And that burnout and having that time to step out and reassess was tremendously important to me and tremendously valuable to me. And I think the last two years, I've seen people, like you say, kind of do exactly the same. They've reached that burnout. They've reached this, hey, I don't, I don't want to be doing this anymore. This is the people wanting too much from me and too little time for too little reward. So actually, in some way, this last two years has actually been a good time for people to reassess, for people to take stock and to look at what they're truly worth. And it's actually something I spend a lot of time with the people is reassessing, revaluing what their true worth is. A lot of people would think I'm only worth this, especially if they're employed, especially if they're with, you know, being with a company for long, because that boss, if you like, is telling you how much you're worth, how much you're worth per year, how much you're worth per month, how much you're worth per hour. When truly I know, I, I know it better than they do until I start working with them to see it. And then they begin to see how much they are truly worth, how much they are truly worth per hour, per week, per year. And that's when you begin to see people shine. So first of all, there's got this away, to, away thing. Somebody's just got to realize that taking this break where you are right now isn't necessarily your be all and end all. You are capable of so much more, so much more to give to people. And that's why I, said, I talk about the passion earlier on. Everybody has this passion. Everyone has this power of their voice that they, they can just go out and share and be themselves rather than be the I'm going to sound horrible, but be the puppet for someone else. But everyone, you know, a job is a job and we need to do that. But you still got to be yourself and realize who you, who yourself is. That is wisdom. And, you know, I want to know from you, Gary, as the world is changing, we, we living in very unprecedented times. Uh, what are the big opportunities you currently seeing? One of the biggest opportunities I'm currently seeing is the growth of the self-worth. It's, it's growth of people. You know, it's funny how we can tie that because if you look at any social media platform now, but particularly the TikToks, particularly uh, Instagram, then followed by Facebook and followed by, by YouTube and, and LinkedIn, what you're seeing is a lot of people now are beginning to see that actually there are opportunities for them that they never saw before. With the rise of, you know, and the ease of, of cameras and phones and the internet, people can actually say, hey, let, you know, you take the old adage of how do we build a business? How do we build in sales? We've got to get people to know us, like us and trust us. All right. We've got to do that. Social media has allowed anyone to be able to do that today. You get online, get to show who you really are. Be yourself. Don't be that Gucci suit with dirty underwear, if you want to rephrase that. Be truly who you are. Enjoy who you are and share it with people because, you are infectious. You, the happy you is infectious. And the happy, that's when we people have followers today. So the biggest thing I've certainly seen over the last two years, people working from home, people not having to be bogged down by work, is more and more and more people are having the ability now to become higher earners, become business owners, become entrepreneurs. And once they add on the skill sets like marketing and copywriting and sales and presentations, once they add on those skills, they become unstoppable. And then you look back and you think, why did I spend so many years there? When <laughs> look where I can go, you know? And I think that's the important part, again, is to look where you want to go and, and never believe that you can't do it because you can do it. 
you really you just don't know how to do it yet. We don't know what we don't know. So until someone shows you, I always like the fact that if we know, you've probably heard the phrase, you don't know what you don't know. But what most people don't think about is if you don't know what you don't know, you don't even know the type of questions and you don't know the type of people to ask what you don't know because you don't know it. So you're stuck in this don't know mentality. So being around people, being around infectious growth oriented, success oriented people allows you to think, oh, I never knew that. Ah, that's what's, ah, what I call the BFOs, you know, the blinding flashes of the obvious. You go, it was so obvious. Why didn't I know that? And being around the right, right type of people really does help to do that. Oh, brilliant. And, you know, you mentioned social media and Gary, a lot of people will be like, but I've got social media. I've got Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, all of the above. Uh, but people don't like my posts, which brings me back to so many people are afraid to put anything out there because they're so afraid of people's response to it. How do mm. you deal with it and how should people deal with it? That's, that's that, You're absolutely right. That's a, that's a really good observation. The people are afraid of being judged because of... So where social media is really good, it's also really bad because it's built this online bullying mentality that unless you're perfect, it's going back to my Chinese mother bringing me up and saying, if you're not perfect, if you're not the top, you are rubbish. And you do know this. And I know there'll be Asians out there listening. Do you know your cousin? Your cousin is a super this. Do you know that? They're of this. Why can't you be like this? And social media is the new Chinese mother. Right? <laughs> it is. Look how great we are. <laughs> it's it goes back down to go who you are who do you, knowing who you are not what you want i want the bigger house i want the better life i want more time work life balance that's all things you want but who what about you what do you want and why do you want it because once you start following that path you know well i'm here and this is what i want and why i want it then it doesn't matter about the path because you're focused on the path you're not focused on anybody else it is your race to run there is not. Remember, you're the one on the track. You're the one that's been practicing every day to run the 100 meters. There is a reason why football players, soccer players get paid an awful lot of money. They get paid more, but then people will pay for tickets in the stadium because they're not willing to put the work in. They're not willing to be the success. They'd rather sit there and moan at you for succeeding and shout at you for the silly mistakes that you made that they disagree with. So once you realize that you are the Olympic runner, you are the soccer player, you are the person running your own race because you know exactly where you are. In soccer and football, you know that you score more goals than the opposition, you win. You know in race, if you're going to run 100 metres, you know where the 100 metre line is. You don't stop at 80 metres. You don't stop at 50 metres and go, nah, I don't think the last 50 metres is worth me because that person over there said that I was running funny. You don't run. You, you focus on what you want and you focus into that line. And that 100 metre line becomes a 200 metre line. The 200 metre line becomes a 1,000 metre line. 1,000 metre line becomes a 10,000 metre line. And you grow through your strength. But there is this social media fallacy that you have to be great to get going. And it actually is the complete opposite. You just have to get going to be great. And you've got to stop trying to be perfect from the very beginning. You know, nobody comes out of the, into, this, into this world being perfect at anything. We have to work at it. We have to take on board what we don't know have the conviction to, to, to learn how to do it, then have the conviction to practice it until we get better at it. And then who cares what they say? Then they're the ones cheering you because you actually got there. So that's, that's my take on that. That's brilliant. That should be everyone's outlook. And, yeah. you know, leading me from that into what you do, right? You help people sell high ticket pricing on their products you help them value themselves better you help them you know really put themselves in the market in a way that the market will respond to but they themselves will get value like financial value and self-worth out of what are mm. some of the biggest obstacles you find when people first approach you one of the very biggest ones is self-belief a self-belief that um i can be who i want to be because it's because it, where that comes from is that i don't know where i want to be I think I know where I want to be. I think I want to be a success. And there's a lot of things out there to say, hey, just write down your goals. How much do you want to earn this year? Oh, I want to, look, I want to earn 100,000. 
But why a hundred thousand? What does a hundred thousand mean to you? A hundred thousand, and why do you want it? Well, because that seems to be what everyone wants: learn, earn six figures, earn seven figures. But what does it actually mean to you? And they think, "Ooh, I'm only on thirty thousand at the moment. Six figures seems so far away." So this, they're really, really putting this mental block in front of them. So sometimes we have to remove and redefine what our goals are. But once you think about from every entrepreneur's perspective, and without fail, over the last 15, 16, almost 18 years of looking at entrepreneurs, one thing they have above all in abundance is their passion to do what they do. They just love what they do, whether they be a dentist, a tomato seller, a coach, a gardener, a landscaper, a dog, they have this passion, if they're an entrepreneur, to be the very best that they can be. And that does put pressure on them, which is, which is, but it's also a good thing. But when it comes to it, especially what I call heartfelt industries, coachings, consultants, service providers, you know, they say, oh, I just, want, I just want to help people. I want to coach people. I don't want to sell. I don't, I don't want to come across. So they become their own worst enemy. And then what they try to do is they over deliver. And when they over deliver, they're not doing themselves any justice and they're not doing the audience any justice. So what I tend to teach people is say, first and foremost, let's look at what your real goals are in a real achievable manner and the reason why you have them. And then let's put a plan together that we are putting step by step forward. So you're, you're building that little muscle, you're building that foundation like a house, and then we can go for the higher things. You know, but the, one of the biggest ones is once they see that belief, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I did achieve that by looking forward and go, have you, we've all had that. How many times have we been driving along the road, right? We've been driving along and we're going to work somewhere, or we're going somewhere, and we just go off in this daydream. And then suddenly we go, how did we get here, right? How did we get? Because we're not so much focused. If, if we compare that to the very first time we drove, we're kind of looking at every car, we're looking at every, every road sign, we're looking at the map, we're looking at everything. If Once we do it time and time again, you suddenly realise you're there. And you've got there but through perseverance, through having a goal, through having a, a GPS system, through having the knowledge to get to where you want to get to. And you'll be surprised how well you can do. Oh, man. And, you know, you spoke about selling. And I know that a lot of people, as soon as you say you have to sell this, I think for most people, and I might be exaggerating, they're thinking of that used car salesman who's coming with his cigarette, you know, and coming to coerce you into buying a car that's no good so so how do we change how people see selling it's something it's it's been a passion and a bugbear of mine to change how the sales industry is seen now that from obviously you can tell i'm, I'm from london originally um, i now live in america i'm very fortunate to live here in america now but there's a complete different attitude um, between the two countries. I've coached and spoken in Australia and South Africa and Singapore. And it almost is until we come to America where sales is a profession that people want to learn. The rest of the world, as you quite rightly said, is they just feel yucky. They want to take a shower afterwards because they just, they just feel so slimy at it. And the reason why that is, is because quite simply, the old 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, boiler house, cigar sales, car sales mentality is there. And that's how people think they should sell. And they think, I don't like that. I don't want to do that. And I don't blame you. I don't want to do that either. You know, you don't want to go, hey, be slick. And they, they, the, the, one of the key words there is making rapport. Whenever you learn any type of sales, like, build rapport first. And you see these terrible, terrible films in the past. They go, oh, you go fishing. Oh, like, yeah, where do you go? For? Love, love the fish. And you never picked up a pole in your life. You know, it's just being false. And that old last decade way of selling doesn't work. So one of the challenges I have with my clients is making them realize that what they know no longer serves you. They keep thinking that buyers, so that, that sellers and entrepreneurs have to change. But what they tend to forget is that buyers have changed as well. We, as buyers, as consumers, we've changed. We know all the sales tricks, the old sales tricks, and that makes us feel uncomfortable. So as buyers, we've changed, but there isn't really that massive change in the sales industry to go along with that change. So it's been one of my biggest passions is to change that industry and say, look, today's consumer is about serving. Today's consumer is about really listening to what is their challenges, what is their problems, 
and really forget r- rapport shouldn't be like 40 percent of the conversation rapport is 10 minutes it's like hey are we okay well we got a good chat great let's look at your problem let's go like a doctor mentality when the doctor turns around to you you go oh, i've got a stomach and they, have you ever done that when they come to your stomach you go, and they're pressing your stomach and they you go does that hurt and they go yeah so they press harder they don't go oh oh at least we found it no they press harder because they truly want to make you better they're not going to surface sell you they want to dig deep and get to know you and say, hey, this is my passion as a doctor to help you. But I can only help you if I truly know you. I don't need you to like me, actually. I just need you to trust me. And if you can trust me, because I know what I'm doing, I can help you. You be honest with me, I'll be honest with you. And let's together, let's get out of this pain. And that is the modern way of selling. That is the modern way of serving people and not that old car salesperson with a cigar <laughs> and the big old flary collars. <laughs> of course, you can't leave that out. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. And, you know, as we move into this new world where so many people are doing so many different things, but also there are a lot of markets that people will say, Gary, this is already a saturated market. And I put that in eight quotes because I believe that if you are bringing your own uniqueness to an environment, that that's what's needed. But so many people will come and say, I don't want to do speaking. I don't want to do coaching. I don't want to, you know, give people information because it's already such a big market. What do you say to that? Car market? (laughs) Housing market? (laughs) Investment market? It, everything is saturated because it's, it's almost like you don't want to be the first anyway right you don't want to be the first on the battlefield you don't want to be the first one going in because that's when you're going to get arrows in your back you almost want to go where the market already is and as you quite rightly say Candice it's about the differentiation you know one of the biggest challenges let's go back to cars for argument's sake a Toyota Corolla is a Toyota Corolla how many Toyota dealers are there so one Toyota Corolla can't say this Toyota Corolla is better than the one down the road because it's the same Toyota Corolla. But with the market is saturated mentality, that means nobody would ever buy a Toyota Corolla because they're all, there's just too many of them. But people do. It's still one of the best selling cars in the world. So what makes the difference? Why do you buy from someone? And this is what the key thing is. If you can find out who your differentiation is, don't start selling the product, sell the result. If you are the person selling the outcome, not the product, not the service, this is how you differentiate yourself. You start by saying, where are you? Where do you want to be? Let me help you get there. And by showing that you are truly there as a partner, as you like, as opposed to a commodity. Once you fall into the commodity world, then the market is oversaturated. And then the only thing you can do by then is to reduce your prices. And there's always going to be someone who can charge less than you. Always going to be someone who can charge less than you. So the key is not to become the commodity, but to become the difference. And if you can help people today solve their problem, give them an idea of what the outcome would be like if they were to solve this problem, then they are more likely to go with you, almost like a silent partner, if you like. And because you're going to be there every step of the way. And I don't mean that literally be there every step of the way, but they make them feel like you care. Make them feel like that you are actually going to do what you say you're going to do. And it's lots of little lots of little gratifications lots of little wins along the way and they know that you're there for them so the market isn't oversaturated because there's only one of you and if there's only one of you it can't be oversaturated oh i love the car analogy that you keep using because i think it makes it so much clearer for people to actually look at and see it within themselves as well And Mm. I know in the speaking industry, I've spoken and uh, interviewed a lot of coaches. And one thing that I enjoy speaking about is boundary setting. So you mentioned it now where you are like, you're not literally going to be with people every step of the way. But I know that people who are in the service industry, people who really do this because they want to help people tend to overinvest and they tend to be like, "Uh, you can call me at any time of the day, you know, so I want to know how do people set effective boundaries as they enter these spaces? Yeah, that's something that I suffered with as well. When I very first started, it was I couldn't say no. I wanted to be everywhere. And then when I kept getting invited to speak here and there, and I, I was double booking myself. I was on two different airplanes at the same time thinking, how am I going to do this? Because I just couldn't say no. And then you, you have people who you really want to help. And this is why you've entered the industry, because you really want to help them and see them succeed. And you don't want to let them down by not being there for them. But 
there is only one of you. <laughs> so the idea there that the best way to deal with that is to actually say, what are the milestones that people can achieve? So we, we talked about the outcome. Where are they starting and where's the outcome that they will get by working with you? Now, you, like you said, you don't have to be with them every step of the way. But once they get these little wins, you set the boundaries. Say, look, I'm going to help you get to this bit, but you've got to do your bit too. There is a done for you. Know, there's three types of industry in coaching, as you know, right? There's done with you, there's done for you, and there's a do it by yourself. Okay, the do it by yourself is easy because you just tell people what to do. They go off and do it by themselves. It's the IKEA mentality. Here's a box of rocks, here's the and wood, and here's the instructions. Off you go. And that's why 90% of IKEA stuff falls to pieces because people can't put it together. Then it's the done with you, you know, and they say, hey, we're going to do it with you. But the key word is there. It's not done. It's with. It's with you. You've actually got to do the part, right? You've got to do the part with me. I can only be here to do my part, my boundary setting. This is your part, which is why it's one of the best ones I love. I love the done with you mentality. I love the done with you model because you can guide them, you can be there, but they've got to go and do their work as too. And that's how they grow. I'm not going to go to the, I'm not going to go to the gym and lift weights for you, right? <laughs> I'm going to, you've got to lift the weight, all right? And then they're done for you. Well, that's then a completely different kettle of fish because you are doing it for people. That's what you're offering. The outcome is you doing it for them. But then again, it's a case of the two things. Either you, do, you take on as much work as you need, but if you're not earning as much, if you're not earning as much, then you raise your worth. You raise your value. So you're still doing <laughs> the done for you. But you also have boundaries. So you have your time, you have your growth, you have your recovery. Because if you keep doing it, go from one client to the next client, and one client to the next client, if you have too many clients, you're not charging enough. It's a simple fact. Too many clients, you're not charging enough. Raise your prices. So if you can raise your prices, you do that by raising your value, you do that by raising your worth, and you do that by explaining what the outcome, not the process, is worth. What is the outcome worth? to your client not what the process is worth to your client don't be a commodity be the result oh don't be a commodity be the result i love that and one thing that i've seen across a lot of the people who comment on our channel and that speak to me directly they will ask things like you know how do i overcome the guilt of not being able to help everyone for free because people will be like, you know, Gary, you say you're this nice guy. You say you want to help the world. You say you want to do all these good things. And I'm asking you as one person to help me for free and I'll pay you back. And, you know, they get enough of these requests for them to actually start having anxiety about it. So what do you do about those kind of situations? Yeah, that is, that is a very, very common uh, thread within the coaching, consulting and the service industry. It's like they do really want to help. And there's always going to be the person that says, look, I'm asking you, I love what you just said there, Candy. It says, I'm just one person. It's just me, little old me. You know, there's no one else like me. It's just me. And, there was, and you come across those a lot more and a lot more often than you think. But sometimes, again, once you go back down to your why, what are you doing this for? You're doing this for you, your family, your growth, your future, your pension, your children. Why are you doing this? Once you are very clear on why you are doing this, then you can set the boundaries of who you help and how you help them. But you can't do that unless you know within yourself what is it you're doing and why is it you're doing it. All right. That's the most important thing. Look after yourself first. Make sure you're healthy first. But once you have that, yes, you're going to come across people who say, can you do this for free? And what I would say to that, and what's what I've always, always prescribed is this. There, there is so much information out there today. There's a big information glut out there that anybody who wants to know anything can go online now and get information for free. But there lies your challenge. The world doesn't need more information. The world needs transformation. And the only way people are going to get transformation is by stop listening to more information and actually do some 
work and actually get things done. So yes, I can help little old me and I, all the little old me's in the world by giving information out there and giving them the first step. And do you know what the biggest challenge for most people is? Is the first step. They don't need to know how to get from, from step one to step 10. What they generally need is step one to step two. That's where it basically does get going. And once they get going, they see the results, then they can start afford to pay you to get you to help you get them to seven, eight, nine, and 10. So don't give all the information away because you don't have to. The old phrase, one of my favorite phrases, the people who pay will pay attention. They've paid you for your expertise to give you the result. Remember, once you stop thinking as a commodity, you start thinking as a result, they've paid you to get the result. So if you are, are getting paid the worth of that, they will say, I've paid for that. I've invested. I've got myself invested. I've invested in Gary. I've invested in Gaddis. I've invested in John. I've invested in Pia. I just want to invest it, so I'm going to do the work myself as well to get me to that result. If it's just information, there's a glut of it out there. So by all means, give as much information as you want to, but set your own boundaries. But, but if my advice would be only give the, uh, your free advice on the steps one and two. Just get them started. Getting people started is usually the hardest thing for people. And then once they get on that flow, they become unstoppable. Oh, that is brilliant. And Gary, I want to know, what is one big goal that you are pursuing that you want to share with us? One big goal. I, I have so many, but there is, I think the, the more you get into personal development, the more you listen to yourself, and the more, you, more uh, you know, I'm around people who are pushing the boundaries every single day, the masterminds I'm in, you know, you, when you get surrounded by that, you suddenly think your goal's not big enough. <laughs> you, you think, oh, I've got a big goal. And then you're sitting there somewhere, you pay 25 grand, 100 grand to be in a mastermind, and they take their goal, you're, ooh, I just suddenly feel like this again, all right? And you suddenly go, but being in that environment, thinks, well, I can do that. If they're doing it, I can do it. And one of our biggest goals, and, and, and I think it comes down to two things. It comes down to the biggest goal for me personally, as Gary Lafty, as a, as a human being. And then there's Gary Lafty as a human doing. And I think Gary Lafty as a human being is to always be the best example I can be. You know, lead by the best example. And my biggest goal would always be to, to I don't care if they're the haters out there, as long as I'm making the world a better place every time I do. Right? Everything I do, everything I put there, everything I say, be an example, either to my kids or to my people, is leave the world in a better place and be that better person. That's my Gary Lafty being. The Gary Lafty doing is to, ironically, the last two years has really helped this, is letting over a million, million of people, starting off a million, if I can get to two million, get to five million, it'd be great. But I'm making a million entrepreneurs see the value, their worth, their their ability and their growth and seeing a million entrepreneurs around the world. And it doesn't matter. You could be, as I said, you can be a tomato seller or you could be uh, the world's best consultant out there. It doesn't matter when you start seeing your own worth. And I want to help you see your own worth. Stop, take, take that limit off, take that cap off the thing. Yeah, off your thing. You can achieve anything you want because if someone else has done it, you can do it. You just don't know how to do it yet. And it's just a helping people find the right way. It's not necessarily with me, but if you're in, you find the right path and you're with the right people, you'll be able to achieve it. We are amazing people. We're amazing human beings. Oh, the definition between human being and human doing is so brilliant. And Gary, we are at the end of our interview, but I've got two final questions for you. The first one is, what is real success to you? Real success? Real success to me is doing what you want, when you want. Like Tony Robbins says, it's doing what you want, when you want. Be able to do it without restrictions, but having the self-control to make sure that you're staying on path. And the, and the path can change every day, but real success means you have the choice. I'm, I'm a great believer in that the more choices you have in life, the better you can be. The, the lack of choice in life is the one that restricts you. So real success is being able to do what you want when you want. And that basically boils down to choice. Build a life that gives you choices as opposed to give you a life that builds your life that gives you restrictions. Because once you have choices, anything is possible. Oh, choices, choices, choices. And the final question for you, Gary Lafferty, is what is something about you that we will not find on Google? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I used to say is that I, I, I love shark diving. I used to go uh, uncaged shark diving, but you know, I started off in Mozambique and stuff like that. Yeah, I love feeding, sh I love feeding sharks uncaged. You know, we're not talking about great whites down in Cape Town, all right? We're going to Mozambique and I'm, and I'm, I'm out there in the cage, but that was the most exhilarating thing for me. The first day I did it, I loved it. I, I sucked up all my air in like 10 seconds. Because <laughs> when the shark started coming towards me, you know, I thought, oh! But the, I got the bug. I love challenges and I love pushing myself. And the next day I was back down there again. I was feeding sharks 40 minutes when these sharks were... were bumping me all over the place and one thing you realize that sharks don't need you they just want to they just want to eat so as long as you're not the food and there is other food and you're calm and you're collected you're going to be fine and you know what you're doing obviously but the thing i don't think you'll find on google about me is that actually i'm a classically trained double bass player i have i've played in uh, the proms at the royal albert hall twice actually <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> bizarre right wow yeah. that is the coolest thing i mean from shark well i was gonna say shark cage diving but just shark diving to being like a classically trained bongo it's like what <laughs> <laughs> what i absolutely oh, I love it <laughs> diversity eh? love it <laughs> i love it gary this has been such a privilege and an honor thank you so much for being here with me no i do i've had such a great time thank you for being a fantastic host you've, you've really made this really easy for me as well but i've had such great fun oh thank you that interview was absolutely phenomenal. Usually I would say to you guys that I look forward to serving you again next week, but I do hope that I continue to see your growth evolution and your growth journey transform so many other people. Because as we know, as we heal ourselves, we heal all those around us. It has been my greatest honor, privilege to have encountered each and every one of you. Thank you for allowing me to walk you through your journey. And I look forward to seeing you again in another place at another time. Goodbye.